Okay, I'm not going to say the 1983 film Kroll is the greatest fantasy epic ever made, or call it a classic film that will go down in the annals of film history as a beacon of what is excellent in fantasy filmmaking. But what can I say? I like it. In this video, we're going to take a look back at Kroll and examine why there are still people who have a soft spot for this film. <laughs> Set in the mystical planet of Kroll, the movie follows the story of Prince Colwyn and Princess Lyssa, who are determined to save their world from the evil beast and his army of slayers. The film's plot weaves together your typical classic tale of love, heroism, and the struggle between good and evil. But what really sets Kroll apart is its ability to transport us into a captivating and imaginative universe. At the onset, a narrator describes a prophecy regarding a girl of ancient name that shall become queen, who shall choose a king, and together they shall rule the world, and their son shall rule the galaxy. Uh, that's a big jump from planet to galaxy, but when I saw this in theaters in 1983, I was all for it. Sign me up. Kroll was a, a massive production in 1983. It cost $30 million, and when you adjust that for inflation, it would be creeping up to about $100 million today. And for comparison, it's more expensive than a film like the Predator prequel Prey, which was made for about $88 million. It's not a massive budget c compared to some of these huge budget Hollywood films today, but it's still impressive. And the budget shows in some really cool ways. First, they built 23 sets. They used one of the biggest studios, Pinewood in England, and they made several sets that are really amazing. I've always been fascinated with Kroll's set pieces. One of the many set pieces that I love is when the characters go to seek out the Widow of the Web. She was this enchantress who uh, loved one of the, the wizards from long ago and was exiled to this this layer of the crystal spider for murdering their only child. There's a hope that this woman can provide a location of when and where the Black Fortress will show up, where the beast will be. And, and um, of course, that's his residence, but this is where Princess Lyssa has been kidnapped and she's sort of hiding out. And I think the concept and design of this sequence, it really stood out to me as a kid. And today when I watch it, it's really amazing. It's from its vivid visuals to the stakes of the sequence and the lore. Uh, all these elements really worked for me and shows you really what genre filmmaking of the early 80s was capable of. But there's so many more designs that I love. I was completely enthralled by the Slayers. And to be honest, I kind of like them more than the Star Wars Stormtroopers. They seemed way more effective. But remember, the Stormtroopers at first were pretty terrifying. I mean, think about the time they stormed the Carillion Corvette at the beginning of Star Wars. <clears throat> Excuse me, A New Hope. Okay, back to the Slayers. Great design. They were scary and mysterious. Never underestimate mystery and how it can bring about fear in an audience. It seems that the Slayers were conquered by the Beast when it conquered other worlds, but the film never explicitly says this. They were powerful minions. They scaled walls, rose from swamps, and they were not easy to defeat. In my opinion, they had all the hallmarks of excellent, excellent minions. And when a fight broke out, in Kroll against the Slayers, it always seemed tense and there was an uncertainty in what the outcome would be and who would survive. Overall, great design and execution. Additionally, we have to mention James Horner's score to the film. I mean, this film is ha, musically is really wonderful. It, it, enchanting melodies, powerful orchestration. It just elevates the emotions and intensity of each scene. The score is perfectly synced with the visuals. It, it enhances our connection to the characters and the world they inhabit. It's top tier stuff from a composer whose work I've always loved. Are there weaknesses to the film? Uh, sure. I mean, obviously the beast is a bit distant. The chemistry between the two leads is sort of absent. And there are a lot of cliches throughout. But we do have a Cyclops, Fire Horses, a Moving Dark Tower, and the Glaive. How dare I almost finish a video about Kroll without mentioning the Glaive. This weapon is amazing. I can't tell you how many times I used the Nerf Boomerang from the 1980s to replicate the glaive. Sadly, it would often get, you know, stuck in trees or, or fly off never to return. I think I bought four or five with my lawn mowing money to just live out my Kroll fantasies. Kroll is fun. Uh, it's a fantasy film with a surprising cast. It has Robbie Coltrane, Freddie Jones, and Liam Neeson, not to mention a bundle of other great character actors. I love when actors like this show up in genre films, and generally speaking, those actors go for it. I mean, there are some that don't. 
but the cast mostly goes for it. Kroll is a film that reminds me of a time when fantasy sci-fi films were a staple of my growth to adolescence. There was a stretch of time wherein I would watch movies like The Dark Crystal, Dragon Slayer, Beastmaster, Conan the Destroyer, Clash of the Titans, and Enemy Mine on cable TV all over the course of a weekend. Ah, it's such a good time. If you've not seen Kroll or it's been a while, go check it out. It's a blast. Whether you watch it ironically or not, I think you'll be entertained. And as always, thanks for watching and living in the past with me.